Hello, I'm Sue Nelson, a science journalist and author, and welcome to the Royal Society of Chemistry series discussing chemistry and climate change as we look forward to COP26, the United Nations Climate Change Conference in November. For nearly three decades, the United Nations has been bringing together people from almost every country on Earth for global climate summits. As you'd expect from the Royal Society of Chemistry, they'll be showing that chemistry is vital for understanding and tackling climate change, with a focus on batteries and energy storage. In this series, we'll showcase chemistry's contribution to electrifying the planet's energy transition to net zero and powering new discoveries and innovations. Today, we're going to be discussing how we move beyond the lithium ion batteries we rely on every day. We'll start by asking how they work and why they're currently the most widespread battery technology, from phones to electric cars. The development and refinement of lithium ion batteries are enabling an electric vehicle revolution. However, the next generation of batteries promises faster charging, longer lifespan, greater capacity, and lower cost. So we'll go into the future. What can we expect from novel chemistries? How will they solve the problems of the current generation? And what new limitations might we encounter? Answering these questions and more are an international panel of four chemistry experts. Professors Mauro Pasta, Rosa Palacine, Magda Titorici, and Kim C. And we'll start with each of them giving a short introduction about their work and areas of expertise, starting with Mauro. Thanks, Sue. Let me start by thanking the Royal Society for organizing this event and for the invitation. Uh, my name is Mauro Pasta. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Materials at the University of Oxford, as well as the project leader of the Solid State Batteries Project, often referred to as SOLBAD within the Faraday Institution that I'm sure you're aware is the UK's independent institute for electrochemical energy storage uh, research. I lead a research group working at the intersection between electrochemistry and material science to develop novel batteries. Um, battery chemistry is beyond lithium ion and I'm sure we'll have the chance to discuss what beyond lithium ion battery means uh, today. I'm particularly focusing on what I believe is holding back the electric revolution as you defined it, Sue, uh, EVs in particular, in particular uh, which is lithium ion batteries cost and charging time. I'm particularly interested in solving issues um, associated with implementation of metallic lithium, both in liquid electrolytes and solid electrolytes and their interface with electrodes and in replacing uh, the lithium chemistry with more readily available and expensive elements like uh, potassium. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, I also acknowledge the invitation because it's an honor to participate in this panel. Uh, my name is Rosa Palacin and I am a research professor at the Institute of Material Science of Barcelona, which belongs to CSIC, the Spanish National Research Council. And I have uh, dedicated my research career to the study of uh, battery materials, mostly electro materials uh, on uh, different technologies like uh, nickel batteries or lithium ion batteries, which are already commercial. But in most recent years, we have more focused on, on what uh, Moro was mentioning beyond lithium ion batteries. We initially worked a little bit on sodium and now we are mostly focused on um, trying to see whether uh, battery technology is based on multivalent elements, so not lithium or sodium, but for instance, magnesium or calcium would be viable. This has a number of challenges because the chemistry of uh, those metals is very different from that of lithium and sodium, and, uh, and this brings in some bottlenecks. But uh, we do very fundamental research to try to achieve proof of concept to see whether this would be viable. And then, of course, uh, if it works, uh, try to upscale and, uh, and so on. So looking also forward to the discussion of pros and cons of different alternatives. Thank you. Magda. Hi, hello. Um... Um, yeah, it's also an honor for me to, to be here. I'm Magda Titirich and I'm a 
Professor of Sustainable Energy Materials at Imperial College in London. I am also the new president of the Royal Society of Chemistry and Materials Division. And so I've been involved a little bit with RSC, um, bringing this event together, which is very important for our future sustainability. Um, so in my group, uh, we develop sustainable materials, mostly from widely available bio waste. And we use this by um, taking some inspiration from nature. And we also apply these materials in important emerging technologies that are critical to reach our net zero goals. Um, so of course, we all know that the way we currently source these advanced materials in these emerging technologies is not the most sustainable. And we still rely a lot, for example, if we take lithium ion batteries in consideration of cobalt in the cathodes, graphite in the anodes, and lithium itself, and all these are considered to be critical materials. Um, so, as I said in my group, we use various techniques uh, and various biomass derived precursors, such as cellulose um, or lignin, to produce all sorts of advanced materials technologies. And in particular, to batteries, I look on how these uh, new and sustainable materials perform also in batteries that go beyond lithium, so sodium ion batteries, potassium ion batteries, or aluminum ion batteries. And we're trying also to dig into the fundamental science and understand everything from materials properties to their relation in performance and interfaces as well. Thank you. Last but not least, Kim. Thank you, Sue, and um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really also an honor for me to be here on this panel. Um, so I'm an, uh, I'm an assistant professor of chemistry at the California Institute of Technology. And my group works on the chemistry of, of next generation systems. And like Rosa, we're focused on a lot of divalent systems like magnesium, calcium, and zinc. And we're also working on um, a variety of, of materials and electrolytes that, that go into developing these divalent systems. So, um, my group takes sort of a holistic view of the cell, but from a fundamental perspective. So we think about the electrochemistry of the materials at the anode and the cathode, but also what happens in the electrolyte in between. So we think about solvation structure of, of those cations in solution. Um, and also, uh, if it was a solid electrolyte, how we might get divalent cations to move through, through a solid material, either an electronic insulator, which you would need for an electrolyte, or a conducting material, which you would need for an electrode. Um, and then on the cathode side, we're very interested in materials that undergo what I call multi-electron redox, um, and, and others call it that too. Um, so this just means more than one electron transferred per transition metal or per atom. And so we have projects looking at anion oxidation as opposed to transition metal oxidation. Um, and then we also have projects looking at conversion chemistry of sulfur at the cathode. So taking a very abundant material that's uh, produced as a byproduct of petroleum refining and using that as the active material in a battery, either with um, lithium or with magnesium or calcium, for example. Thank you. And uh, there are quite a few mentions of things and subjects there that we're, we're going to get um, onto. But before we do get onto the subject of beyond lithium ion batteries and what comes next, it, it would be good if we sort of first understand, getting to basics really, how lithium batteries actually work. Mauro, could you give us a, an outline of this, please? Yes, thanks, Sue. Um, the analogy that I usually make uh, to explain um, how a lithium ion battery works without being overly technical is an analogy with pump hydroelectric power. So in a pump hydroelectric power plant, basically a dam, you have a water reservoir at the top of a hill or a mountain and one at the bottom of the hill. When electricity is needed, you have water going through a pipe, uh, through a turbine that can turn this mechanical energy into electricity. The more water you have in your reservoir, the more energy you can generate. The higher is your hill or your mountain where a dam is, is built, the more energy we can generate. Um, the system can be recharged. If you think about it, you can re-pump water uphill, ready to uh, discharge it again. And a lithium-ion battery works in a very similar way, but not an atomic scale. Instead of having water going through a pipe, we have lithium ions moving from material with a higher energy level or energy content, which is called anode. And commercially, that's um, graphite. 
through a liquid, which is called electrolyte, all the way to a material with a lower energy level, which is the cathode, uh, which is usually made of, of an oxide, of a transition metal oxide. And we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about nickel, cobalt, and sustainability during our discussion. So the more lithium ions your cathode or anode material can, can host, which is called technically capacity, the more energy your battery will be able to store. The higher is the energy level difference between anode and cathode, which is called voltage technically, also the more energy we can store. And similarly to pumping back water uphill in the pump hydroelectric pow power, in my analogy, we can move back lithium ions all the way from the cathode to the anode by supplying uh, energy externally, and that's the, the charging process. Now, many people are familiar with lithium batteries being in their smartphones, for instance. Where else can they be found? Definitely in electric vehicles. Uh, and we're all familiar with that. They're driving the electric vehicles revolution. And um, over and over, we're thinking also about an application in grid scale uh, energy storage, in particular as a second, second life. After they've been used in electric vehicles, they could be implemented on the grid to smooth the implementation of renewable energy with the grid. Uh, I, I was quite surprised to discover that they've actually been around a lot longer than I, I thought. They've been on the market for around 30 years. Um, how have they evolved during that time? Yes, they've been commercialized by Sony in 1991. Yes, you're right. It's actually 30 years now. Um, they evolved. What, what is interesting, and that's why we're talking about beyond, beyond lithium-ion battery today, uh, most of the improvement is derived by um, industry, and in particular, their decreasing cost by economies of scale. If you look at the fundamental chemistry of a battery of 2021 to the one in 1991, fundamentally from a chemistry point of view, is not that different. It's still an intercalation chemistry. You still have a graphite anode. You still have a transition metal oxide cathode. We have less cobalt, more nickel and manganese in your cathode in order to decrease cost. But again, fundamentally, that chemistry hasn't really changed. And, and that's why we basically squeezed everything we could squeeze out of this chemistry. And it's now time to look beyond so limitations there, it, it's not just cost, as, as you've said. There's also, as anyone knows, if they've got rechargeable batteries, that after a certain amount of time, they don't recharge very well either. Is, is that one of their sort of key uh, limitations as time's gone on? Absolutely. Yeah. Just to be clear, there is nothing majorly wrong with, with current lithium-ion batteries. There are millions of EVs on the streets, and uh, they've probably driven billions of miles. But you're absolutely right. Cost is one of the problems, charging time, energy density, their cycle life, so how many times you can be charged and discharged, safety, and something that I hope we'll touch on today, uh, recycling, because as more and more batteries are um, and cars are um, reaching the end of their life, uh, there is definitely a problem of what we're going to do with these batteries. I mentioned earlier second life, but recycling will definitely play a role in, in research in the next few years. So those limitations then, are they likely to be overcome by different design or more likely different chemistry? I would have to say that we are basically getting close to the theoretical limit of the energy density of, of lithium ion. So we've done a great job also in decreasing their cost by optimizing economies of scale and, and building the gigafactories that we're all familiar with. I would say that if you want to get to the next level, we we'll probably need to look at a different chemistry. Magda, uh, let's turn to you now, uh, you know, particularly with the COP talks coming up, if we want cheaper batteries for grid storage, one potential avenue there is through using cheaper metals. Why is sodium being considered an alternative to lithium? Yeah, so, so indeed, as Mauro explained very well, the principle of a lithium ion batteries, sodium ion batteries work in a similar way yeah, there are a lot of differences between lithium and sodium. But the point is that sodium does have clear advantages compared to lithium in terms of sustainability. First of all, um, it's everywhere. We have a lot of sodium, sodium chloride mines in Europe, and we don't need to rely on mining lithium, let's say from, from the desert in, in Chile, and is also more sustainable mining. Um, then you don't need to use copper as a current collector, which you do need for lithium-ion batteries, and use aluminium, 
Aluminium is the third most abundant um, element on the planet and the most abundant metal, and it's also the most recyclable metal on the planet. So in terms of sustainability, again, this is another advantage. Now, in terms of the electrodes, uh, sodium cannot intercalate into graphite, which is the anode of choice for lithium ion batteries. Again, graphite is also considered a critical material. I think we will talk about this a little bit uh, later on why that is the case. So sodium can intercalate into another type of more disordered carbon materials, which you could potentially obtain from waste precursors, such as bio precursors, any of your food waste. And this is something that we do in, 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 in our group. And you have the opportunity of recycling waste into some advanced materials that you use for advanced applications like sodium ion batteries. Um, and if you think of the cathode, cathodes for sodium ion batteries, they're mostly uh, on P2 or O3 type of inorganics, which do not rely on critical materials such as cobalt and nickel, and they can be based on manganese or layer oxide based on uh, iron and phosphorus. So overall, um, if you do something that is called life cycle analysis and look at the sustainability and environmental impacts of all this, indeed sodium have the potential to be way more sustainable than lithium and produced at about half of the cost uh, of, of lithium ion batteries. However, of course, the performance. That was not... exactly what I was about to go on to there. <laughs> yeah. You've given all the advantages, but how similar is it in terms of performance? So again, the performance is not quite there. And in theory, um, because sodium um, is, um, is uh, below lithium, uh, the energy density theoretical won't be quite as, as high as lithium. But I think although sodium ion batteries have been known almost as long as lithium, they've been left behind. And there is a lot of optimization and a lot of fundamental research to be still done in, in sodium ion batteries. I think what is promising is that the largest uh, EV and battery manufacturers from China, which is called CALT, have recently announced their plan to go commercial with sodium ion batteries. And I think they said that this is going to happen in 2023. And if I'm not wrong, they announced 160 watts hour per kilogram sodium ion batteries, which can recharge in 15 minutes. So this is promising, uh, as it is more or less where we are with lithium today. And it means that we might see sodium ion batteries implemented in EVs, not only in, in stationary uh, energy applications. Again, the battery market is very diverse. As, as Mauro said, we need things from grid storage where sodium ion batteries have a true potential, but also shorter transport. So a city like London or, or Barcelona or, or, or LA, you know, you need, um, you need um, um, this type of scooters or things like this, which uh, sodium ion battery is the ideal technology for it. Rosa, can we move on now to multivalent chemistries? And um, this is where you use elements with greater charges on their ions to create batteries with better energy density or that can use cheaper and more abundant metals. What's involved in these types of batteries and which metals are showing the most promise? Well, uh, those technologies are now, I would say, much less mature than uh, sodium, for instance, because sodium is much more similar to lithium, so it's easier to implement the know-how that we've learned from, from, the, from the development of the lithium-ion battery technology. But one relevant thing is that as batteries are expanding the field of application from portable electronics to, uh, to electric vehicles to the grid, um, not all batteries, uh, not, not all the requirements for, for those applications are the same. So it's very difficult to think of a silver, silver bullet battery which will serve all the purposes. So in the case of the um, 
multivalent uh, batteries, we would uh, use metals as negative electrodes, which would mean very high energy density. And in fact, lithium metal batteries uh, have also been uh, developed and uh, using lithium at the negative electrode instead of graphite. The issue is that when cycling those batteries, as Mauro was mentioning, and the, the lithium ions are moving from one electrode to the other, when they come back to their initial uh, place, they, they do not deposit on a flat surface. They grow forming dendrites, which are sort of needles, which can just uh, uh, make a hole in the separator and then short circuit the cell. So, uh, of course, lithium metal would be the, the anode with higher energy density, but th there are problems to use this one. So, the alternative would be to use magnesium or calcium, which are not that um, relevant as, as uh, the energy density is smaller than for, for lithium, but they are less prone to this dendritic growth in principle, and also they are much more abundant. The issue here is that one is moving an, a, a, a ions with, with have two charges instead of one, so they will move slowly when uh, compared to lithium ions, so probably those batteries will have less power than one can could achieve with lithium or sodium. So I would say that this would be for high energy, for applications requiring high energy, but less power. So the problem is uh, a little bit was what Kim was mentioning is that uh, for the development of lithium or sodium batteries, one is thinking, okay, I'm gonna focus on the electrolyte and improve the properties on I am gonna focus on the anode and the cathode because there are standards for the other components. You can look for your new positive electrode and test it against graphite. The issue with the new technologies is that we don't have any well-established standards. So the only way to go is what Kim, what Kim was mentioning to, to look at it in a holistic way and try to develop all the things at the same time. But this is slow because uh, we need to optimize everything at the moment. So uh, we need to start by developing new protocols, make sure that they are reliable. So research is slow. And then also the, the development of, of the technology is not there yet as, when, uh, as it is for the case of sodium, which is very mature. Even in the UK, there are um, startups uh, building sodium ion batteries at the moment. So it's something that uh, it's, it's to be developed on a longer term, but I think it could be, uh, it could be relevant for, for specific applications where power is not the, the, the strongest requirement. Well, Magda mentioned how China are, are now going to be producing sodium ion batteries, which is a, you know, a huge boost to the technology. It does sound like it's perhaps going to be a, a, a tougher hill to climb, say maybe, to bring these types of batteries then to mass market. Sure, uh, because uh, there, is, uh, there is first uh, the, the development of the prototype at the lab level. So make sure you find a good combination of cathode, anode and electrolyte, which works, but then comes the engineering part. So the the cell uh, and uh, how to ensure that the interactions between the components are not uh, detrimental for the aging of the battery. So then comes all this engineering aspect and this, we, we have not tackled that yet because we are on the first stage, we're trying to achieve a proof of concept that something works at the lab level before taking it to the next stage. So for sure, we're, the, the, the road is long and winding. <laughs> And, and how long do you think that road is going to be? Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to say, uh, but um, the thing is that for, for some applications like the electric vehicle, you have huge batteries with a large number of cells. So um, any battery which is going to be in, in an electric vehicle in five years is already working today at the lab level, so to say. It's, it's different if you're thinking of smaller batteries that can power sensors or internet of things devices or so this, this can be faster because you only need to, to, to prove uh, the feasibility of uh, small cells and this may be easier, but to, to, uh, to make big batteries, this is really uh, many years, I would say. I wouldn't dare say a number, but uh, longer term, yeah. 
Well, well, so far we've mainly talked about the metals and potential replacements for lithium in batteries, but um, as we've touched upon, the anodes and the electrolytes are also equally uh, important. Mauro, could you sort of hone in on the electrolyte here in terms of what tends to be used at the moment and 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 its role and and where those changes might be made on on that level yes the electrolyte is the key and it's also the key of implementing more energy dense uh, chemistries um, i believe that of the three components is probably the one that has been less investigated um, uh, in particular, fundamental properties of electrolyte haven't really been characterized to the level that should have been. Uh, thinking about liquid electrolyte, their transport properties, the relationship of these transport properties with the formation of interfaces, absolutely fundamental and important. Uh, moving forward, you were asking me, uh, going from a liquid electrolyte to a solid electrolyte could um, solve some of the issues associated with this electrolyte that are mostly associated with, with safety. Um, current liquid electrolytes are made of organic components that are prone to catching fire. Um, so all the accidents you've probably you know, seen in the news or heard about in the news are due to the electrolyte. Is the electrolyte catching fire? A move to a solid will help solving and tackling a lot of these challenges. So not only safety, but also implementation of more energy dense materials, as well as the ability of uh, charging and discharging these batteries faster. Would that have a, a potential knock-on effect on battery weight, which obviously is not such a big deal if you're doing something in the lab, but if you want to use batteries to charge a plane, for instance, then, you know, to power a plane, then the weight is crucially important. That's a very good question. It depends on the solid electrolyte you are working with. If you're working with a polymer or with a sulfide solid electrolyte, for example, they're not intrinsically heavier than a liquid. Their densities are very similar. But it comes down to their design. And there is something that there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. And there is something that we are working on within the Solbat project at the Faraday Institution, this fundamental understanding of the challenges associated with the implementation of solids uh, at scale in particular. And, and what would that switch to a, a solid state battery? What, you know, what would that mean? It poten it's potentially a game changer, and that is why I believe the, the community, both the academic community and the industrial community in the battery space, are extremely excited about sodium ion. Um, I mentioned some of the key metrics earlier, um, but a, a move to a solid state could address the issues associated with uh, liquid electrolytes in key metrics. As I already mentioned, safety by replacing a flammable liquid with a solid the safety issue should be practically solved. Uh, energy density and cost. A solid is mechanically more stable. Uh, Maria Rosa was mentioning the problem of dendrite generation in, in when using metallic anodes. Uh, a solid electrolyte could, in principle, tackle and solve this issue. And also from a charging time perspective, uh, solid electrolytes, in particular ceramic solid electrolytes, um, allow for faster charging times. Uh, fundamentally, only lithium ion can move in these electrolytes and therefore um, charging time is favorable. So not a big surprise if every major automotive company and also a lot of startups and battery companies are on uh, solid state. Again, lots of challenges need to be addressed um, from a fundamental science point of view. Um, there are several challenges, mostly mechanical. Um, these dendrites shouldn't form, but still they do form. Uh, solid electrolytes tend to crack. Uh, we lose contact between active material and electrolyte upon cycling. We need to apply very high pressure to maintain a, a good contact between active material up, up during cycling. And these are more fundamental in nature. And then we need to also think about scalability issues. Um, solid state electrolytes are hard, hardly, I would say, implementable with the current gigafactories. And that presents problems from an economies of scale point of view and ultimately uh, cost. Would anyone like to add to that in terms of the switch to solid state batteries, uh, Magda, for instance, or anyone else? Yeah, I would like to, uh, I mean, uh, um, reemphasize what Mauro said in terms of overall design of a battery. And, and, and of course, maybe a little bit futuristic, but we can imagine that if we design 
a light, solid electrolyte based on a polymer or sulfides with high ionic conductivity, but we also designed the electrodes in a way in which we eliminate all the dead components in a battery. And when I mean by dead components means the current collector that is used to code the material on or the binder, which is used to hold the materials together. Then we have the potential really to go much more lightweight in batteries and, and power potentially an aircraft. In particular, you could think of a configuration where you would have carbon fibers which would have very strong mechanical properties, but at the same time, they would be able to store charge with a solid electrolyte. So you can imagine that the whole body of the airplane will be the battery itself. So you don't need to have that battery, you know, in the back of the plane or in the back of a car, but the battery can become the body of the transportation EV. I, I've read that it, the, the battery could even be in the wings of a plane. Yes, yes. So um, not, I mean, in batteries, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of fundamental scientific issues, but also manufacturing differently than the way the first lithium ion battery has been done is key. And, and this is something that is researched uh, a bit in Solpath, but also other projects in the Faraday Institution and of course, all around the world as well. It would be interesting to know why better electrolytes have been difficult to develop, considering they've played, you know, an important role in these types of batteries for, for decades. Mauro, would you answer that perhaps? Sure. Um, there is one fundamental problem, I, I think. Um, the formation of interfaces in contact between electrolyte and, and active materials. The formation of solid electrolyte interfaces, for example, or cathode electrolyte interface at, at the cathode material side are mostly governed by kinetics and not really thermodynamics. So it's very difficult to predict uh, from a fundamental principle point of view what your interface will look like. So there is a lot of trial and error and the whole development of electrolyte has been mostly trial and error, at least until um, these days when more computationally driven uh, methodologies are employed. Meaning um, in a normal traditional electrolyte, there are several uh, additives that are added to the electrolytes, not necessarily known um, what they do and how, but we know that they work extremely well. Um, this trial and error approach, as you can imagine, is not very efficient. It can only be done at, at a higher scale industrial level in, in an effective fashion. And I believe that has been one of the reasons why uh, a more rapid implementation and development of electrolyte has been a little problematic. Um, Magda, if we move on to the, the anode side of things now, um, we've already heard that graphite is currently used in nearly all um, lithium ion batteries, um, so much so that it's actually considered a critical raw material in, in the very fine grades that are, are required. How do you improve the carbon then in batteries? Yeah, graphite is an interesting one because if you look, and I'm not a geologist, but if you look at the total uh, uh, amount of graphite, uh, it's not that it's not abundant. We still have a lot of graphite. The problem is it's not equally distributed geographically. And most of our graphite resources are in China. And as we talked before, China is the biggest producer of EVs in the world. And then this puts pressure on the availability of graphite for other countries. And so therefore the European Union is considered graphite as a critical material because of its economical importance. Yet of course, because it works, all the lithium ion battery manufacturing companies are not really thinking of changing necessarily the anode for now. What the future will bring, I don't know, but you can make graphite synthetically as well. And to make graphite synthetically, you need a precursor that is already quite aromatic in its nature because basically graphite is a stack of graphene on top of each other. And in order to get there, you need an aromatic precursor. And these precursors could come from petroleum, like naphthalenes or things like this. As we move away from fossil fuel, the soil companies may want to reorient their business to make synthetic graphite rather than powering a car by oil, you power a car by making synthetic graphite. 
Now, the problem with making synthetic graphite is that you need to go way above 2,500, even 3,000 degrees centigrade to get a perfect arrangement of a graphene layers on top of each other, which are spaced by exactly 3.34 Armstrongs, I guess it is. Um, so, um, so it is difficult. As I said, there, there's other opportunities to make more disorder carbon, maybe where the interlayer spacing is not exactly 3.344 Armstrong, but it can vary and also is not so uniformly distributed. These are called hard carbons in, in chemistry. And as I said, these are the ideal anodes for sodium. Um, sodium does not fit in graphite, and the reason is complicated and has to do with a lot of thermodynamics. But also, you could potentially intercalate lithium and potassium, this more disordered carbon. It's just a matter of potentially doing um, a little bit more research on it. And I'm not sure we're going to see that for lithium, but clearly we're going to see a lot of that for, for the next generation of uh, sodium ions. I think in China, the way they go for sodium ion batteries and replacing um, the anode is using the more disordered coal. They have a lot in China. They want to get off fossil fuel. China also said it's going to get to net zero by 2050. So they're using the coal that is a more disordered form of carbon as, as an anode material, so not so high-grade um, graphite. And, and could this research research lead on to both electrodes, the anode and the cathode, cathode being made from carbon? I mean, there are some technologies. Um, I guess you're referring to the so-called dual ion batteries, or maybe mm -hmm. dual anion cation batteries. And the way this work is that you have the anode, you intercalate an alkali metal, this could be anything from lithium to sodium and potassium. And then you have an electrolyte that is an ionic liquid. And then at the cathode, which is also based on carbon, you intercalate the anion from the ionic liquids. Draw drawback with this technology is that there's no real redox reaction. They're based only on intercalation chemistry. And so the energy density is going to be way below lithium or even sodium ion batteries that can be only maybe 30 to, if we're lucky, 50 watts hour per kilogram. Um, the advantage is that you can have high power, so you could charge these batteries really fast. So they could have an advantage, for example, in public transport, where you could imagine you would have a bus powered by this technology. The bus would get enough power to move quite far to the next station, much further than it would move with a supercapacitor today because the energy density is a bit higher. Because they charge so fast, where people get on and off, you know, this would be enough to charge and move to the next stop. So, yes, for certain, as I said, the battery market is diverse. I don't think we're going to see dual ion batteries in our own personal EVs, but for public transportation, that could be an ideal and very low cost technology and very reliable because the cycle life is very good in these uh, materials as well. Uh, Kim, we've we've touched on just very briefly there about um, aircraft and and the use of um, of, of of batteries there. Lithium ion batteries are considered too heavy for, for some uses, particularly with uh, aircraft, which means we need batteries with much higher energy densities. Do lithium sulfur batteries hold promise when it comes to aircraft use? Lithium sulfur, well, the biggest benefit of lithium sulfur is certainly the energy density. So it has a factor of maybe six times greater energy density than what you could get out of a lithium ion battery. And that's because the chemistry at both electrodes is fundamentally different than what you get in lithium ions. So um, as Maro and, and Magno talked about intercalation chemistry and the ion just moving in and out of a host material and a lithium sulfur battery, it's sort of um, the exact opposite of that. The ion is undergoing the charge um, storage reaction itself. So lithium is plated as lithium metal, which we, we've already touched on um, at the anode, and that gives you very high energy densities at the anode. And then at the cathode, you have uh, sulfur that is able to store two electrons per sulfur atom. So you go from sulfur to S2 minus. And that's a, that's a huge increase in the number of electrons you can store per unit mass, because if you think about 
a metal oxide electrode, um, if you have, let's say, lithium cobalt oxide or any of the NMC materials that have nickel or manganese in them, you're storing one electron for every metal and two oxygen atoms. So just thinking about it that way, it's pretty obvious that you get a much higher energy density. Um, but there's a lot of challenges associated with lithium sulfur, of course. That's why it's not in aircraft now. Um, and some of those challenges stem from the, the fact that you are doing these sort of uh, uh, high capacity reactions at both electrodes. So going from lithium to lithium, lithium plus to lithium metal, that's a huge volume change at the anode. And then going from sulfur to lithium sulfide, you have a huge volume change at the cathode as well. Um, and the, the reaction pathways by which you get from sulfur to lithium sulfide are quite com complicated, and they often involve um, phases that are in the electrolyte. So this is very different than lithium ion, where you have this sort of straightforward reaction of lithium just coming in and out. Instead, now you have sulfur. Sometimes you have intermediates that are, that are in the solution if you're using a liquid phase electrolyte. And then those solution phase species can then precipitate as your final product. Um, so, you know, things are just moving around a lot more and it's a lot harder to control and to understand. So um, there are, there's a lot of work going into also solid state lithium sulfur batteries. That's a, a very exciting field um, whereby you can uh, sort of get away from this intermediate and solution. Um, but then you have to worry about the kinetics. We sort of talked about kinetics as well. You have to worry about the kinetics of that solid state reaction at the cathode now. So now you want to go from sulfur to lithium sulfide without going through a solution phase intermediate. And if you do that in a solid state fashion, then the lithium has to diffuse in both end members, so in sulfur and in lithium sulfide, and any intermediate you have in between. Um, and it's, it's a lot more difficult than that. So um, from an energy density perspective, it's very promising. Um, it, it has very high energy densities that would be, that kind of meet the bar for aviation. So now we just have to work on the, the fundamental problems associated with um, the reversibility of the chemistry. It sounds such a, a delicate balance that you've got to get in terms of sustainability, technology, um, the energy density, the, the weight. Um, <laughs> it, it, but it sounds a solution that, that you are working and getting towards a, a, a solution effectively. Yeah, I think a lot of the, the really interesting work in lithium sulfur is happening in the electrolyte because um, you're sort of stuck with your electrodes. You want a lithium metal anode, you want a sulfur cathode. So that sort of gives you the electrolyte to play with and, and the interfaces. So a lot of that, the really interesting work is happening there. And I think there's a lot of uh, great advances that have happened in the last, I don't know, I'd say six years or so, even just understanding how, how to control the mechanisms and, and the chemistry. Uh, and what about magnesium sulfur batteries, how, how do they compare? So magnesium sulfur is really interesting to me um, from a fundamental perspective, but also from an energy density perspective. So the, the benefit of magnesium sulfur is you have a magnesium metal electrode and magnesium metal is a much denser metal than lithium. So from a volumetric perspective, you're doing a lot better. Um, of course, from a gravimetric perspective, you're not. But the other benefit is that magnesium metal, like Rosa was talking about, when you plate magnesium metal and do magnesium two plus to magnesium zero and electroplate that at the anode, um, you get a much smoother surface than you get with lithium. So you have less issues with dendrites at the same current density. So if you were to compare them apples to apples and plate lithium at one current density and plate magnesium at the same current density, magnesium gives you a smoother surface. Um, so that makes it a lot safer than lithium metal because <clears throat> you don't have to worry about the dendrites that can short and then catch your electrolyte on fire. Um, the other interesting thing about magnesium sulfur is that the cathode chemistry is completely different. So if you start doing um, the, this sulfur to sulfide reaction, instead of forming lithium sulfide, you're hopefully forming magnesium sulfide. And instead of forming, and the intermediates are different as well. So with lithium, you form what are called lithium polysulfides. And with magnesium, they're magnesium polysulfides. And that might sound very trivial, but it's not because you have a, a divalent cation instead of a monovalent. And so the solubility of those polysulfides are different. The speciation of the polysulfides are different. The disproportionation kinetics between different intermediate um, compounds are different. So it just, it adds another uh, way for you to tune the chemistry um, and take advantage of this really high energy density magnesium metal electrode. Um, but again, for magnesium sulfur, the key there is the electrolyte. Um, so there's a lot of work going into electrolytes for magnesium sulfur. 
um, and trying to figure out, you know, what electrolyte works at both electrodes. And that's always been the, pro the problem for batteries is trying to find, you know, what's an electrolyte that works at the anode and what's an electrolyte that works at the cathode. Um, and for magnesium, the anode surface is very dynamic. Um, the lithium surface is also very dynamic, but it has an endpoint. So it, it changes, it changes, it changes, and then it's stable. Magnesium is sort of different than that. It, it doesn't really ever become as stable as a lithium surface does. So um, the electrolytes are a little bit harder of a challenge for, for magnesium than they are for lithium. Uh, and does this sort of different type of chemistry that's now being used um, for batteries that go beyond lithium batteries mean that there could potentially be other uses for these types of batteries that we're not able to, to use them for right now? Yes, I, th I think that, I mean, I, I'll flip that on its head a little bit and say that magnesium sulfur is never going to replace lithium ion. Um, you know, lithium ion has a, has a very specific niche. Well, I guess it's pretty diverse, actually, the, the things we can use lithium ion for. Um, give, there give, are, give us an example of that diversity that they can be used for then. I mean, I, I have, what, five lithium ion batteries in this room, probably. Um, so they're in cell phones and laptops and electric vehicles. And that range is pretty wide as it is, um, I would say, you know, for, for something that can power a small computer that can also power a car. That's pretty impressive. Um, but for magnesium sulfur, I think one of the, the biggest benefits is the sustainability. So, you know, you're using materials that are, are sustainable at both electrodes and they're very inexpensive. So that could, could possibly be used for something like grid storage, let's say, um, if, you, if you had enough space to put something there. So the, the, the biggest downside of magnesium sulfur is it's low voltage. Um, it's a low voltage material, it's a low voltage system. So the, the power or the energy density is a little bit lower for that reason. Um, you make up for some of that with the number of electrons you can store with the capacity, but um, you still have a low voltage cell. So if you if you needed a high voltage application, you would have to stack them in series to get the voltage that you need. And then there's balance of plant associated with that. So as long as you don't mind that part of it and, and you have an application where you can really leverage the sustainability aspect and the inexpensive um, um, properties of both electrodes, then I think that there are are applications that you can think about. So now you don't have to worry about, you know, where's my cobalt coming from? Where's my nickel coming from? Where's my lithium coming from? You just say, all right, we have these two very abundant elements and we can put a bunch of them in a cell and get a high energy energy battery out of it. Um, and so, you know, things that I like to think about are, are like grid storage, for example. Um, Maro brought up the second use of lithium ion in grid storage, which is also a really interesting option for that. Um, but if you were to think about, you know, something that's just very cheap, maybe magnesium sulfur would be an interesting application there. And, and in terms of applications, it might be interesting to know um, how you can adapt these newer technologies into existing technologies, because you can't obviously necessarily change everybody's smartphone. It's the new battery's got to fit in with, with, with what we've already got is is that a sort of effectively an assumption or a done deal or are some of these batteries perhaps causing uh you know a few more tweaks perhaps required i mean i i i, I can start and i saw that yeah traditionally we made batteries like this as we know them they're square then they're rigid and this is how we think of batteries and and of course chemical industry doesn't want to change the way they do things because once it works why would you change it you make a profit but here and there there are some people that come and challenge the system and these are the real disruptors so i do think that we're going to see completely different battery formats um, very soon and i just gave you an example with structural batteries or your whole laptop will be the battery or your whole mobile phone will be the battery, they could be more flexible, we could roll them up, we could pack them to put them in a pocket. You know, we don't need to manufacture things quite exactly in the same way. Um, and if we talk about sustainability of manufacturing, the, there's not only the materials, but there's a lot of drawbacks in manufacturing, the way you use glues for these packs, the way we stack them together, the way you bind the electrodes, 
um, to the current collectors with what is called PVDF, which is a very toxic materials, the way companies don't really label anything. So you buy a mobile phone, if you try to open the battery, you don't even know what is inside. All these things are have to change in particular, if we want to trace materials that are critical, we need to have digital labels to know where would it come from. And also, I know we are talking about alternative chemistries and there will be a recycling section, but as Mauro said, recycling would be key in particular for lithium ions, but also as we move to new technologies that are less economically viable, we need to think how we're gonna recycle these things, how we're gonna recycle magnesium or sodium, because we don't want these batteries to pile up in a landfill, you know, and, and recycling is driven by economics. So there's so much complexity around batteries from materials to materials manufacturing, to performance, to degradation and safety and to end of life and manufacturing is, is just very intrinsically complex. Yeah, if, if I may add something, is that in addition to all these processes needing to be sustainable, then we, we also need to question the origin of the energy used to produce batteries or to recycle batteries, because if we are finally making them via a very sustainable process or using very sustainable materials, but then we, we obtain the energy burning carbon, then we're doing nothing. So I think that on top of that, we need to make sure that the energy is produced from renewable sources. So uh, this is a, an additional requirement, but without this, we are going nowhere. Would you agree with that, Mara? Absolutely. Um, a, a more general point, maybe, I think we touched on that. Of course, they, um, beyond lithium-ion technologies that are implementable in the current lithium-ion manufacturing plants will be the ones that will be easier to implement on the shorter timescales. If you think that any gigafactory, you probably need to invest a few billion pounds to build. Uh, there's a big economic incentive on maintaining these gigafactories up and running and working. So if you're beyond lithium-ion battery technology is fully implementable, in a current lithium-ion battery plant, um, the implementation will be definitely uh, easier. On recycling, that's actually a very big point, and I'm glad that there is a separate discussion on that. Um, Lithium-ion, they're very complex. Magda touched on it, a uh, lot of components, which makes them very difficult to recycle compared to, for example, batteries that we're more familiar with, like lead acid, that are now recycled at over 99% uh, efficiency. Um, two aspects there, a policy aspect, I would say, making sure that you know, we take care of our environment, an economics aspect, as um, transition metals and, and supply chain of lithium make the cost of raw materials higher, and this is already happening, it's very cyclical, but it will probably improve as demand increases. Um, recycling will also play a role from a circular economy uh, point of view in, in decreasing this cost. So I'm very glad that there is a whole discussion on that because it, it definitely deserves um, attention. And are there other batteries that could perhaps potentially have in the future more energy capacity so that they could run for longer and perhaps be really ideally suited for, for the grid? I'll take that one. Um, the, the metric on grid is not necessarily energy density. Uh, it's, it's mostly cost. And in particular, pound per unit energy per cycle. So how much you pay for your energy and for how long that battery will last. So you want to make sure that we'll store them somewhere, uh, ideally far away. And um, they can cycle as many times as possible. And we don't need to worry about this technology for uh, five to 10 years. At that time, you know, we can replace and, and change them. So at that point, cost would be the, the key driver. And I can think of uh, battery technologies like redox flow batteries. Um, we can think about um, different technologies, not necessarily battery batteries only, uh, to meet this implementation of grid and renewable energy uh, need. Um, 
would probably, we will need a cocktail or a mix of battery technologies moving forward, depending on the time scales. So if we need seconds, we can think about a supercapacitors. If we think hours, we may think about um, lithium ion or, or redox flow. If it's even longer, we can even start thinking about hydrogen, for example. Um, so definitely a variety of technologies. And that is why I believe it's important and all the chemistry that we mentioned uh, today uh, are investigated with the right level of, of depth scientifically and hopefully commercialized moving forward. You mentioned redox flow there. What do you mean by that? In the redox flow batteries are very interesting as a concept. Um, fundamentally, you separate anode and cathode, and instead of using a solid material, you use a liquid. Uh, you have tanks of a catholite, a tank of an anolite, that then are flowing through a, an, an electrode, let's say, or two electrodes. And we can decouple by doing this energy and power. There are several technologies that are being explored, potentially very cheap, potentially very versatile. Energy density is definitely not their uh, selling point. Cost is. A um, lot of very interesting science there. And again, uh, definitely worth investigating uh, a little more in detail, more specifically for grid scale application, though. Well, before we end, it would be quite nice to just go around the virtual table effectively once more to for you all to sort of sum up where you see the most promising future is beyond lithium ion batteries and and i know it's difficult but perhaps giving an idea of of uh, the scale and what needs to be done in order to get there kim could we start with you please I'm glad you started with me because I don't know if I'll be able to add anything after everyone else talks. Um, I think, um, so from my perspective, the systems that we're really excited about are really like, you know, shoot for the moon systems that are very sustainable, that would be very inexpensive, but there are a lot of fundamental questions. So really the, the thing we need to do is do the fundamental science and, and figure out how to bypass some of these issues that we have with the, with the chemistries that, that take the boxes for sustainability and cost. Um, so I think that that's, um, that makes me really excited because that's what I love to do is figure out why things work and why they don't work. Um, and I think that that's a really exciting place to be. So I think it's really hard to predict the future for that reason, because we, we don't know the answers to these fundamental questions yet. Um, but I think, you know, lithium ion will be around for a long, long time. Um, there's, and I hope, like Maro said, I think recycling lithium ion is extremely important. Um, but I, I hope that there will be another chemistry or another few chemistries that we can commercialize and, and at least diversify the options um, in the future. Thank you. Magda. Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting question. I think ultimately we need to um, balance performance and sustainability and that is the most difficult task and at the moment lithium-ion batteries they don't tick that box yet. I think lithium-ion batteries is not going to be replaced by anything else it will exist for a very very long time I think soon we will see solid state uh, batteries soon we will see sodium ion batteries, which will tick the box more in terms of sustainability. The exciting thing is what Kim said, all these new emerging technologies, which they may not be ready by 2050 or not even behind or, or maybe implemented, but it's very important that there is still blue sky research to really think beyond the Paris Agreement goals and think of you know, new technologies for the next generation. It is important that we move fast. It is great that we have lithium ion batteries today and all these technologies. It is great that we start thinking of recycling, but we also need to think of new science. And I think with the development of so advanced characterization methods that you could basically look under a microscope on how a battery cracks and see an interface, um, which is amazing to all this machine learning algorithm, give us the opportunity really to, to discover maybe completely unknown battery chemistries of the future that we don't even have touched upon today or, or we can't even possibly think. So I think the future is uh, very exciting for batteries. It sounds it. Rosa. Yeah, I agree that the lithium ion batteries will be around for a while. But uh, I think that uh, 
not, not in all applications, they have the same future. I mean, for portable electronics, like a, a, a computer or a portable phone or so, they are now dominating the market. They are very mature product and uh, probably it will be difficult to, to switch to another technology because the whole value chain is very well established. But when, when one is thinking about the grid, and Mauro mentioned it, um, it's batteries that are not going to move. So who cares if they are heavier? Who cares if they are bulkier? So what we need is that they are cheap, they last long. So maybe in those uh, larger scale applications is where new technologies will, will be introduced first because the requirements are different than those from portable electronics. So maybe, uh, places where lithium ion is not yet established and where it arrived as a guest because it was a technology developed for portable electronics and meeting those requirements. In other technologies with different requirements, new technologies would be able to, to, to be installed or to be deployed faster. And um, of course, we can say this with the, with the knowledge we have today. So we know that there are some technologies more mature than others. And for instance, we didn't mention about organic electrode materials. So most commercial materials today use inorganic uh, electrode materials, but there is uh, also research on, on, on working on, on, on organic electrode materials, for instance. So who knows? I mean, there may be a disruptive fact at the moment, which will accelerate uh, the, the implementation of, of those technologies. So I think the, the relevant thing is that we have a bunch of chemistries under development at very different maturity levels with different figures of merit for performance. So we are ready to, to tackle everything, so to say, to be very optimistic as a final statement. <laughs> and and Mauro, um, you ready to tackle everything, anything and everything. Absolutely. <laughs> I would like to finish maybe from where we started to answer your question. You asked me, the lithium-ion batteries have been around for 30 years, right? If you think about why they were commercialized so rapidly in the 90s, there was a need from the market. So if you remember back then, you know, the Walkmans, the CD players were becoming ubiquitous. And there was a need from a battery technology to power them. Um, an analog to this day is identify driving forces from a need and market point of view that lithium ion batteries cannot satisfy. And I would say we touch on electric flight. That is definitely, in my opinion, one of the keys in the next five to 10 years. Um, flight is very um, detrimental to the environment from a CO2 emissions and global warming point of view. And um, lithium ions cannot really tackle that market effectively because they're not energy dense enough. So they don't store enough energy. So we talked about lithium sulfur. We partially talked about uh, solid state for this application, energy density, definitely. And to finish on um, implementation of um, renewables in the grid, as more and more renewables, hopefully, will, will penetrate in, 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 on the grid, um, this grid will become more uh, unstable and we will need more and more batteries to actually smooth out this power output Lithium miners are still too expensive right now. And therefore, we need to identify cheaper solutions if we want to implement it at that scale. So again, with an analog par parallel to, to portable electronics in the 90s, I would say electric flights and grid scale storage will be the drivers that will define which beyond lithium ion battery technology will be implemented uh, first. Yes, and, and it's interesting to note that EasyJet have partnered with a, a US firm and they're actually going to start testing uh, electric planes from, from next year, I, I believe. I know it's it's pretty soon, so you're right. It's it's all about the market, isn't it? Even even a pandemic can't stop people always wanting to, to travel, uh, for, <laughs> see things face to face. Well, that concludes our Royal Society of Chemistry Beyond Lithium Batteries discussion. My thanks to our panellists today. They were Professor Mauro Pasta from the University of Oxford, Professor Rosa Palacine from the Institute of Materials Science of Barcelona, Professor Magda Titarici from Imperial College London, 
and Professor Kim C from Caltech in the United States. And thank you all for watching. You can find more Royal Society of Chemistry discussions around the UN's COP26 programme on the RSC website at rsc.li slash COP and the numbers 26 or also on the social media channels. So I hope you'll join me, Sue Nelson, and a host of expert guests for more episodes in the series as we explore chemistry's vital contribution to electrifying the planet's energy transition to net zero and powering new discoveries and innovations. The chemical sciences are at the heart of sustainability solutions. Sustainability, powered by chemistry.